with Microsoft Research in Cambridge, and I'm here to tell you about the Con Confidential Consortium Framework, which is our, our project. Uh, it only says on the last slide, which might have been a mistake, but it's open source on GitHub, uh, so please feel, to, feel free to check it out. So what we set out to do is uh, build a framework to make it easy for people to construct multi-party applications with good guarantees. Um, so one of the things that's often a problem is the, the lack of governance mechanism. So we wanted to have a verifiable consortium governance mechanism, a system where you can have very well-defined governance rules for the multi-party application, uh, which are easily verifiable to all participants, to members themselves, and to also users, so they can see that the network is, or the application is run in the specific way that uh, is promised it is to be run. Um, we also want fine-grained confidentiality, of course, so um, people should be able to have very fine-grained control of their data. It should be possible for application makers to make it so that you can only see or reveal you know, what's, what's useful and appropriate for business purposes. Uh, we want a very simple programming model. Uh, everyone wants a simple programming model. We want it to be approachable and make it easy for people to get those guarantees. And of course, we want high availability and high efficiency. It's no good to have a, an easy framework if uh, it, you then have to do a lot of legwork to make your app um, you know, available and, and fast, right? Uh, so broadly speaking, um, from, a, from a, a far away distance, this is what a, a CCF application looks like. You have a number of, uh, of machines uh, which run uh, trusted execution environments or, or hardware enclaves running anywhere. So they could be running in a cloud provider, multiple cloud providers, some of them could be on-premise. It doesn't really matter where. A bunch of users interact with that service. And uh, the members, a set of members, uh, basically provide governance. So the first thing they do is they endorse the service. Um, they essentially um, endorse the identity of the service and make it so that everyone knows that this is the service they're talking to. They also govern the service, uh, so they'll you know, govern the membership sets. They'll, they allow new, new members to join or to leave. They can add and remove users and all that. And they'll, they'll look after upgrades too. So if they need to replace the code, improve the application, fix security bugs and so on, uh, they, they're on the hook for that. Um, separate from them is an operator, someone who's just provisioning things. So they're providing the hardware. They can spin up the, uh, the instances of uh, the nodes that the application is running on, but they're not trusted. They're not inside the trust boundary. So they're spinning things up, and they can provide them to the members on behalf of the members. Maybe the members pay them to make this available to them, but they do not have any specific access to the application. They are not, they're not part of the trust boundary in, in the application. So how do, we, how do we bootstrap that? How do we get that started? And for that, we need a number of trusted execution environments, and we need a way to sort of connect them together and make them into a coherent network. Uh, sorry. sorry. Speak a little bit louder, yes, I can try. Yes, sorry. Um, so trusted execution environments, uh, mostly everyone, except, well, that person left, but mostly everyone is familiar with them. Uh, so what we get um, is we want encrypted and integrity protected memory. Um, so this is, this is key to make sure that the operator, the person who's running the nodes on their machine, cannot have access or cannot, cannot see anything that's happening inside the node. Um, we want cryptographic evidence over running code. <clears throat> so we want the ability to assert at the distance or to check at the distance what's running. And finally, uh, so and, and remote attestation. So we want to be able to do this uh, remotely. And this gives us a distributed trusted computation. So it allows us to spin up a number of enclaves and to check that they are running in enclaves. So the, the, the contents or anything we send over to them or anything they contain is not immediately visible to the people who are running these, these enclaves. We want to be able to know exactly which code they're running. Um, and then we can make them part of the network and we can distribute our application with confidence that uh, information is not going to be leaked or we're not going to have integrity issues or this sort of stuff. This sort of stuff. Um, so how do we do that? So a node overview, um, so a single CCF node roughly looks like this. You'd have a client talking to, to the node. They, they use TLS, so we, we don't support generic byte streams. Uh, we support only TLS. You have to talk to us via TLS. Um, that goes through the host. The host is potentially malicious. Uh, they potentially can look at um, all of the frames and so on, but these are encrypted TLS, TLS frames on the way in and out, so they can't, they can't see anything useful. They can't derive anything useful from that traffic. They're no different from someone who could be intercepting some of the network traffic there. Uh, so the TLS session terminates inside, inside our enclave, and inside our enclave is essentially two bits. There's our framework, which provides a certain, um, uh, certain amount of functionality, and the user application code, which is running whatever business logic there is there. Um, so the enclave contains the application logic and states. Uh, it contains the governance code, which is what we referred to earlier, which is what allows these, these enclaves to talk to each other, and uh, fault tolerance code, so <laughs> code that allows us to distribute essentially the updates across the network and enclaves and make sure that we have availability. If a certain number of enclaves are affected or, or come down, uh, the application still, still can run. 
so communication between the host and the enclave, we, we want to avoid uh, E calls and O calls. So we want to avoid calling in, in and out of the enclave. There's a, there's a number of performance and security reasons why it's not such a good idea to do this on a regular basis. And you, you want to minimize the, the amount of those you, you do. Uh, so the way, we, the way we do things is there's a single O call at start, a single E call, sorry, at startup when we provision the enclave. And then all communication between the enclave and the host um, is done over ring buffers. Uh, so essentially, we put data on the ring buffer. The, enclaves, uh, the enclave reads it out on the other side and then back in. I see a lot of people take pictures, and uh, I want to point out the slides on the website. <laughs> so you don't have to if you, you, know, if you just want the slides. Um, so yeah, the, the communication is basically just the TLS frames in and out over the ring buffers and also heartbeats. So we'd like to have trusted time. There's no such thing as trusted time. But we still need some notion of time, because if we're going to run a distributed consensus, for example, we need something to do timeouts and this sort of stuff. So we take rough time from the host. Um, it's not trusted, and the host could essentially perform a denial of service by uh, withholding time updates or, or sending time updates too often and so on. But we claim this has no impact on um, confidentiality and, and integrity, basically. Does it have an impact on availability? It does have an impact on availability. So if you want to if you want to perform a denial of service and uh, you're the host, you certainly can. But then again, if you're the host, uh, you can impact availability by withholding all TS frames from the enclave, and then not much availability there. So yeah, for sure. Um, then, so the way we do availability is you distribute this, and you have a number of enclaves running uh, set up with a consensus mechanism. And then so you have to take down you know, at least half the enclaves if you're running CFT, uh, maybe a third if you're running a BFT uh, variant, right? But yeah, if you take down, or if you, if, you, uh, if you own all the hosts, then yeah, you can stop the system from working completely, for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so now that, that we have these uh, these building blocks, uh, we can talk a bit about like a joint protocol. So if we have a network that's already established, that's already bootstrapped, so the, the way we start out is we start a single node, um, and then we, we gradually bootstrap the network by adding on new nodes to that uh, to that network. Uh, so the way it works is our nodes create a key pair, um, very much like a GStore scheme, so that, that stays inside the enclave. That's the identity of, of the enclave. Um, and we, the, the node produces a, a quote uh, over, its, uh, over its states. So that's the platform, the code it's running, and the identity. So the platform contains platform information. It contains microcode version, you know, that type of information as well. Um, and then that's sent across to the network. And the network then decides if this node should be allowed to join or not. And there's basically two, two parts to that. One of it is checking the quotes, so making sure that the node that wants to join is in fact running you know, SGX is running the right microcode, is running everything's up to date, is running the right codes um, inside the enclave. Um, and the other part is governance kicks in here. So es essentially a proposal is created and it's put in our state. And then the, our governance mechanism, which I'll talk about just next, um, kicks in and the members get to decide if they want to allow this, this node to join or not. Um, in some configurations, you could decide to allow that all, all the time. So if you've got the right identity, you're running an SGX, you're running the right code and so on, maybe everybody's allowed to join. Uh, there's some reasons why you probably don't want to do that. Uh, or maybe the, the members have set up some rules. Maybe they want to check who's joining first. Maybe they want to just check the quantity of how many, how many things are joining at the same time. There's various problems with um, having too many joins at the same time. Obviously, everybody comes in, and then they have to catch up, and it creates problems. Um, and so the network, if it decides that it, it likes the node and it wants to uh, add the node to its configuration, then endorses this identity and sends data secret, basically, to that node. So consensus can kick in and we can start replicating states to this node because now they can read they can read the updates we send them. Um, and so we have a, a single network identity which is distinct from the identity of the first node but is essentially set up by the first node. And this network identity is what would be distributed. So that can be, you can produce a CSR for that, have it be signed by root CA, or that could be something that the members distribute to their users. So if you think of the members as a group of companies, maybe a group of banks or something, they could distribute this root certificate to their users. And uh, users can, when they connect to a node over TLS, the fact that um, the certificate for the node is endorsed by this root cert, this is how they get um, you know, proof or evidence that the attestation has been conducted properly and the rules of governance have been followed properly. Um, and so, yeah, so once the node has joined, then it needs to catch up on state and become part of the, part of the system. So that leads us into governance. How do, we, uh, how do we build a mechanism to make it easy for members uh, to decide how the network should be governed and operated? Um, so we have, we have our, our consortium of members, and initially what they do is they endorse uh, the, first, uh, the first prefix of the ledger 
and the, and the configuration. So we have the first few transactions that configure our system, and the members have to come in and they, they have to stage a vote basically to say, yes, we, we agree this is the network we think uh, we, we, we want it to start. So it's running the right version of the code, it's running with the right membership, um, and um, we're happy with the identity of the node so far. Um, so they vote for that, and this is recorded. And in general, this is just an instance of our generic governance mechanism, which is uh, staging votes. So you can stage votes to decide things like membership, uh, who should be a member of the network, uh, who should be a user, um, what the network configuration should look like. So I want to add a certain number of nodes, remove some nodes. Um, I want to update the code, or I want to change the versions of the code that are allowed to run in the network. Uh, or you want to change maybe the constitution itself. So all the votes are governed by a constitution, which is a script, which I'll show on the next slide. And this is what decides how the votes are passed, essentially how the votes are counted. And this itself, uh, being part of our state, is something we could update also, probably with different rules. Maybe we want to be stricter about that. Um, so the constitution is a script. The votes are scripts. Um, well, so <clears throat> the proposals, sorry, are scripts. And the votes themselves are scripts. So a proposal could be, um, you know, we want to make this change. And then all the members have to look at that. And they have to say, yeah, I agree or I disagree. But if you, do, if you say I agree or I disagree, then you have a time check, time of use problem because things could have moved on. And maybe you care about some other elements of the state. Maybe, maybe you're happy to add a node, but only if there's already, if there's not like more than 10 nodes already because you're trying to restrict the total number of nodes. So in your, your vote should be something that's executable. It should be something that can look at the, uh, the proposal, but also the current state of the system and say, yeah, okay, I agree with that. Or, you know, given the circumstances, given the state we're in, I don't want to accept that. Um, so, because, this, because your vote is executable, you, you get rid of, of these concerns. And this is, how, this is how we count things. So that's all the slides, and we should see a bit of code. Hopefully it's big enough for everyone to read. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll try and go through that quickly, but essentially this is a very simple constitution samples, uh, sample. Some of them will look bigger than that, they'll be more complicated. Uh, but here all we're doing is we're saying, like look for most things, all we're looking for is a majority of members saying that they agree. So if, a, if, we, if we want to stage a proposal and we want to say we want to add a new member, for example, or a new user, we just want to have a look at the majority of, you, of members, uh, which are currently active, and check that they agree with that. Um, so we count member votes, and essentially we just count member votes for, um, active, uh, for active members. So we, <clears throat> if we have members who have been retired or who are joining and they're in the process of joining, they're not active yet and so on, they shouldn't be counted in this vote. We count all the members the same. We could decide to make a distinction. We could have some tables where we store special members who are like operating members or senior members or whatever. And maybe they have special rights. Maybe they can veto some things. Maybe their vote is, a is, is sufficient to pass the entire thing. It's, it's very flexible. We can do pretty much anything we want here. This is just a simple example. Um, there are some tables where we store information that maybe shouldn't be so easy to modify. So for example, if the members wants, want to stage a vote over, uh, so that there's, there's a whitelist table, which is uh, basically some, uh, the tables that are allowed to be affected by governance. And then we have our governance script table, which is the table that stores this constitution. If people are going to replace the constitution, you're probably looking for something more than just a simple majority. So here in this case, we enforce unanimity. We need to have the, the number of, the total number of member votes needs to be the same as the total number of members that's active. And so if we have a majority otherwise, then you know, we pass, otherwise we return false. And the way this works is very simple. Every time a member sends a vote, um, th their script is executed that decides their vote. Then the constitution is run again, we count. If it's good, we pass. If it's not good, it's still pending, the proposal is still there. Um, there's, a, there's a way to withdraw pro proposals as well if you think there's no realistic chance of them passing. But that's sort of how it works. The types of proposals are fixed. Um, not really. So because your because your proposal. So this is Lua. Um, your proposals are Lua, and the votes are Lua. If you can if you can put your proposal in terms of a Lua script that executes against the table in the key value store that's backing this, then you can put it to a vote. And the other members they'll have to write a script that knows how to evaluate your proposal. Um, and so it might be tricky for them if you propose something sufficiently complicated. Maybe they won't agree to it. Um, yeah, but. When a proposal is, yeah, your proposal is code, so yeah, you have to, you have to come up with. So, so conveniently, we'll look at proposals now. <laughs> so some some simple ones. Uh, the first one is just we want to add a new user. Um, so we're, we we get to see the, the, the tables and and the, um, 
So that's a mistake. It should say user cert. <laughs> um, so we get the tables and the user cert as, as arguments here. And our, what we're saying is we want to add this new user um, to our store. So the, the way this is split is um, the proposals are typically little bits of code and some arguments are templatized and parameterized. So here the user cert is passed separately and is, is passed in. Um, so the next proposal is we're passing a new code digest and we're saying we should be able to run this new code version in, in our system. And um, we can have a look at the ballot here. So a, a vote to evaluate that. Um, so the vote to evaluate that will look at the changes proposed by the proposal. So it checks there's only one change proposed, uh, that the, the proposal is a, a new code uh, proposal, and that the new code is this, this new code ID that we have decided is acceptable. So probably typically what would happen is um, the member would have ahead of time communicated with the other members and say, hey, look, I want to deploy this, this new version of the code. Um, I give you what you need to reproduce the build. Um, you audit the code, you reproduce the build, you get to the same ID, you get the same hash over the code, and you decide, like, yeah, okay, I want to put a vote for that. So you're not accepting the proposal itself, you're accepting this particular code ID. That's, that's what you're accepting there. Um, yeah, so code updates, uh, it's essentially a sort of simple uh, three-phase mechanism. You add a new supported code version through this vote mechanism. Everyone agrees to that. Uh, for a while, when you do that, uh, as you spin up new nodes that run this new version of the code, you want to make sure that the new and the old versions are compatible. Um, and then you can stage a vote to say, I want to remove the old version of the codes. Now, now that we've upgraded, maybe the new version contains a security fix and you don't want to allow the old version to run anymore. So you stage another vote to say, we should get rid of the old version now because we have a good quorum of, uh, of nodes running the new version. Um, and then if that passes, uh, then the, new vote, the, the old code is essentially um, uh, removed. And so nodes that are running the old code can't, can't be part of the network anymore. And now you can tear them down. Uh, so another thing we, we potentially need governance for is catastrophic recovery. So typically we run with a consensus algorithm and it, it'll be, there'll be a formula that tells us how many nodes we can tolerate are, are failing. Um, and that's, that's basically F. So if, if we're running CFT, crash fault torrents, we can, if we have two F plus one nodes, we can, we can lose F nodes and still make progress. If we're running with Byzantine fault tolerance instead, we, we, we need to have three F plus one nodes, then we can tolerate F failures. Um, well, if we have more than F failures, then the network can't make progress anymore because there's, there's no quorum, so transactions can't be globally committed, and now we're stuck. Um, so in that case, we need to perform catastrophic recovery, and what happens is we need to go back to the members who are ultimately the root of trust for this. Um, and they, so we have a mechanism that uses key shares to do that. Um, there's also an older mechanism that uses union keys, but essentially you, you need a way for the members to uh, come together and put together enough information that they can read the old ledger and produce a new service that runs on the basis of the old ledger. Um, and you want to have the, the, new, the new ledger endorsed by the old service. So if people are connected to your service and you have not distributed the new identity of the service to them yet, they can still connect and they still know that uh, this is endorsed by the old identity. Here, the members have quite a lot of power, so it's up to them not to endorse a new service or not to endorse multiple new services, for example, or to endorse a new service unless they're happy with the state of it. But it sort of works the same way as the bootstrapping the first time works. Um, someone stages, uh, one of the members stages a recovery vote, the other, the other members get to examine the state of the service. And if they're happy with the state of the service, then they endorse it and they can move forward. And so finally, we want verifiability. It's, it's no good to have a, a well-defined governance if uh, no one can audit it, because then there's no trust. You have to trust that the code has been written correctly and that all the votes have been executed correctly. Um, so for that to happen, all the governance states, all the, all the tables that hold the governance in our system are all public. So anyone who has access to a ledger, which should be anybody, um, can see what the governance tables hold, and they can essentially play through the governance story. And if anything doesn't match, like one of the votes, you know, the, the total that was counted doesn't match and so on, they can say, hold on, there's, there's a problem there. Um, all the governance transactions have to be signed. This is enforced by the service as well. So you not only can say there's a problem there, you can also blame uh, whoever is responsible for this, whichever the members um, has basically made a, you know, made a mistake or lied about the way they voted, for example. Um, this happens in the same total order as other transactions. So all our transactions happen on the same KV and governance is done over a set of tables, which is part of this KV. They're not separate. so. Um, the, the versions, the, the commit IDs you get for, for governance changes and for regular transactions are in, on the same scale, on the same time scale. Um, so it's very easy to decide uh, you know, which business transactions should have been affected by governance. So 
if a user, for example, has been kicked out of the system and you're trying to figure out exactly until when they could have performed transactions or they should have been able to perform transactions, you can easily because it's part of the same version uh, timeline. Um, and so finally, yeah, all, so all of this is recorded in tamper proof ledger. So we use uh, sort of standard uh, blockchain mechanisms or Merkle trees to make sure that all our updates are, are chained and that you can't just go back and edit some part of the history without it being very, very visible uh, later on. Um, so it's all good to have this stuff, but uh, it has to be easy to write applications for it. Um, so the first, the first guarantee we, we want to make is that uh, unless you really go out of your way to, to log like private information, uh, all data in CCF is encrypted all the time. So it's obviously encrypted at rest. So all the data we have to store on disk uh, for, for recovery and audit is, is encrypted. Um, all data that uh, is sent around the network um, is encrypted on the wire. And in memory, um, we also get encryption from our use of enclaves. Um, so if somebody has access to the machine, they cannot just look at what we're doing. Um, so roughly speaking, our, our application schema looks something like this. The application code plugs in um, in, the, in the gray box, and everything else is, is provided by the framework. So client frames come from the host. Um, that's just TLS. It comes to us as TLS frames. Uh, we have a front-end component that just takes care of um, essentially the, well, the, the TLS functionality, decrypting things. We have authentication against the KV. So remember, we know exactly at which point in time which users or which members are allowed to use the system um, because of our governance. Um, so we can check that. And then if their identity is not allowed to do the operation, they, they say what well, they want to do at this point, we can reject it automatically. It's not something that the user has to worry about. Uh, so things come to the user with this identity that's been uh, verified. So we've authenticated transactions and we've also uh, authorize them at this point. Um, and then the application engine can just produce a set of read and write transactions uh, or, or a single, sorry, read and write transaction against the key value store. So that in their business logic, all state has to go in the key value store that's provided by CCF. Uh, they can perform any operations they want, uh, but in order for the state to be persistent to the ledger, to be recoverable and to be distributed and available across the network, um, it has to happen as operations against the key value store. Um, and then further downstream, we replicate this using consensus. Um, so that, then, that again goes back out to the host. Um, it's a bunch of encrypted frames um, back out to the ledger, so to be to be stored in permanent storage. Um, and at the regular interval, we also uh, so we, we hash all the transactions. Um, we put them in the Oracle tree, and at a regular interval, we sign that, and that goes to our ledger. Uh, so this is this is how we get our, our type of proof uh, audit log. Um, so yeah, so we, we have encrypted TCP frames coming in and out of the ledger, that's sort of, uh, coming in and out, sorry, of the application. That's, that's the only thing that um, goes in and out of the enclave. Uh, we have an append only ledger on disk and all application states must be in the key value store for all the guarantees to hold. So we have a couple of consensus variants. Uh, Crashful Torrents is the main one we use now. Um, uh, we have a BFT implementation that's still kind of work in progress, but uh, which is available in the build for people who want to try it. Uh, so if you use crash fault turns, we have a, an in enclave raft, uh, raft variant. What we do there is if you have two F plus one nodes, you can have F to, up to F failures and the network will still continue to make progress. Uh, because we've added signatures, um, you can blame compromised nodes and you can um, essentially go back to the ledger and um, offline verify you know, what has been done and potentially take things out if you think some nodes have been malicious but it's not happening online. So if, an, if a node somewhere is acting maliciously, uh, they can potentially go on doing it for some time. You have to offline uh, check for that and you know, remove the, the transactions they've done. And so here we rely on the T for both confidentiality and integrity. Um, if, the, if the T is compromised, um, if someone can, uh, for example, tamper with the memory, uh, we won't be able to, to detect it uh, online. It will, have to, it will take some offline audit for it to be detected. Um, if you use uh, our PBFT Verit, which again is still a work in progress, but it's, it's coming online, then um, if you have three F plus one nodes, you can tolerate up to F failures, but you can tolerate up to F nodes being malicious. So the nice thing about that here is that you still rely on the T for confidentiality. So if SGX is utterly broken one day, well, you know, your data still is no longer confidential, but you potentially don't lose integrity if fewer than F nodes are affected. So if you're clever enough about the way you distribute your instances, and they're not all, you know, um, subject to the same attacker because maybe they're in, geographically distributed or distributed across multiple cl cloud providers and so on. Um, if you manage to keep two F plus one nodes um, that aren't affected by the attack, you still keep integrity. So your attacker gets to see the data, but they don't get to uh, manufacture transactions that are illegitimate. 
So the key value store is, is basically our very simple storage interface. There's really just two things you can do with it. You can get stuff out of it and put stuff back inside. Um, like the rest of CCF, it's implemented in C++, so we'll get to the runtimes that are supported, but you can put any old C++ type in and out of, of there. Um, and then for other languages, we have mappings. Um, transactions are, are very straightforward. It's like um, any local key value store we've used. We have strict series and and, and opacity um, so that um, errors only see a consistent state. There's, there's really no, uh, no tricks there. It's very, very easy to use. Uh, it behaves the way you'd expect. Um, you can have app-driven confidentiality because of this very flexible key value store model. So the app decides completely how it wants to expose data. It's up to the application logic uh, to decide how to do that. There is no built-in support in the key value store to label things with certain degrees of privacy or anything like that. It's completely left to the code. Um, and you can, of course, uh, store your code um, in, the, in the store itself. So you have the key value store, and uh, one of the things you can do is some of the values could be code themselves. So if you want to upload scripts, if you want to upload things that can be executed by the users, um, then of course you can. Right? Uh, another thing that the framework provides for you is transaction receipts. Um, so this is a little tricky for you for, for the applications to implement themselves for, for a, a variety of reasons. But basically, applications should be able to, or users that use the application should be able to get receipts from the application that are signed by the service that say that uh, this, out, this outcome happened, and it happened at this version inside the KV. So if you're talking to people who are outside the system, and you're trying to prove to them that uh, something did happen, or, or you, did, you did do something, and you want to give them cryptographic evidence that this thing happened, and it should be something that can be verified offline, they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't need to be a user of that system. to talk to that system to verify that this happened. You can do that through the receipts. Um, and so you can write your CCF apps um, either in C++ directly, which is probably what you do for maximum speed, although it's a bit tricky, but you know, uh, it's not that bad. It's modern C++. Um, or you can use one of the runtimes um, that, we've, that we've built. Um, so the, the standard one that's, that's better tested that governance runs at the moment is, is Lua. Um, we also have a project called EVM for CCF, which allows you to use any EVM compatible language like Solidity to run smart contracts against the KV store. Um, or recently, we've added JavaScript support. It's still a bit experimental, um, and there's there's probably the odd bugs here and there still, but uh, but it's coming as a, as a supported option as well. Um, so that's mostly it. Um, and the code is on GitHub, so go check it out and um, try it out. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. I'm very curious uh, that you have remote station. Yep. Uh, I didn't hear any detail about it, so I wanted to ask: Is it possible? to not be a member of the network and yeah. somehow do remote attestation and say, okay, this confidential network or whatever it is, it has system integrity. What kind of format yes. do you use for the remote attestation structure or some details because I didn't see yeah. any slide about it. Sorry. Uh, so is it working? Yes, like it's working. <laughs> the, the, the remote attestation, so uh, sorry, maybe something I should have made clear is we use the Open Enclave SDK okay. um, and essentially at the moment, so the Open Enclave SDK supports SGX mainly. So our attestations are just SGX attestation. They're the standard SGX attestation. Uh, and Open Enclave is adding support for ARM Trust Zone uh, coming pretty soon. So once they do, but we will hopefully be multi enclave. The ARM Trust Zone has nothing to do with remote attestation. They, they don't have that's a mechanism for that. Yeah, they don't have they don't have a mechanism for that now. Yeah, that's true. So but at the moment, if you if you run this, remote attestation is working. Yes. But it, and, and it's using the format that uh, Open Enclave is using. Uh, that's that's right. Which so is which is the Intel. An open enclave node, and I'm not part of a confidential network. Yeah. I can still verify. You don't need to use an open enclave node. So, uh, open enclave pr uh, provides a small utility library, uh, but the Intel SDK does as well. Um, checking the remote attestation provided by an enclave. It's just a matter of getting the right certs and the right CRLs from Intel. In the right format of the remote attestation structure. Yeah, the, for the format is public. I mean, it's, it's specified in, in the Intel SDK documentation. You don't have such use case where someone wants to externally verify your network. So we, we do. And so if people want to do that, uh, so as a user, you can, of course, trust the network identity because it's been given to you by members and it's endorsed by members. Uh, but if you want to verify the enclave for yourself before you connect, one of the things you can do is there is an endpoint that allows you to get a list of nodes and the attestation for each node. And you could yourself verify the attestation for each node and make sure that it's running the right version of the code. Uh, against an up-to-date, you know, Intel SGX enclave and so on. So you can do that yourself as well if you want to. So if I, if I would like to do that to develop an application using the library you mentioned, from yeah. open enclave, verify externally a yep. confidential network without being part of it, 
Yeah. There is a way for me. You yeah, you absolutely can do that. Yeah, yeah, you, you can absolutely do that. Yeah. And then uh, verify. Yeah, and so you'll be able to verify that basically these nodes are running uh, with a given identity. So they'll have the, the public key uh, for the pair where they hold the private key that's, that's kept inside the enclave. You can. The data in the quotes, like the measurements. Yeah, sorry, what the measurements? So the measurements that are in the attestation of the nodes. Of yes, the so it's the identity of the nodes, the code that the node is running, and the platform details. Yeah. That's what SGX attestations yeah. provide to you. Yeah. But I'll still be bounded by the SGX server, essentially, to get the attestation. So um, if you do this normally, then yes, you have to talk to uh, the Intel servers yeah. to get those certs and so on. Uh, Intel has a mechanism to, to delegate this. So I know that in Azure, if you use the Microsoft Cloud, for example, uh, um, I Microsoft, use a Microsoft service. Yes, you can use a Microsoft service. Okay. And you can set up your own service to do that, but you have to talk to Intel. It's probably not super easy, but it's something you could probably do. Could we, could we, yeah, could we exchange contacts about that? Cause I would yeah, be yeah. Curious, uh, I, I have business cards. Yeah. You can come to me after I talk. Give yeah. opportunity to other people to ask. I'll come to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. But thanks for the answer. Thank you. So you had Vasily? I'm sorry? How, how scalable is the framework? Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, so the, the largest tests we've run uh, so far were with about 20 nodes. Uh, so we run that to do performance benchmarks that we put in the initial technical reports uh, that we published about a year ago. Uh, and this was across two regions. So at the moment, Azure only supports uh, SGX hardware in uh, East US and uh, West Europe regions. Um, so this is uh, sort of 10 nodes. It was like 10 nodes one side, nine nodes uh, the other side. And can you scale it to a larger number of nodes? Like, we hope you can. Um, the benefits are not super clear. Um, so if you, use, if you use Raft, if you use the CFT implementation, the only thing that more nodes lets you scale is reads. So you can scale the reads across the nodes, but the writes still have to go through a single leader. So you're making the leader, the leader busier because it has to replicate to more nodes. Um, but if you have a read-heavy workload, you know, it, it might still be a nice thing. You can also offload uh, signature verification in cases where you have proxies. So if your commands that come in are signed um, because the nodes are part of, uh, are, are verified and are part of your trusted uh, computer base, you could have them verify the, the signatures before they send stuff to the primary. But it's not a whole lot you can uh, offload to secondaries um, uh, in that situation. And in, in PBFT, unfortunately, it's worse than that because um, really every operation is a write conceptually um, because you need to get a proper consensus on it. So it's not just a leader doing things and pushing updates out. Uh, so in that case, you could you could scale up to a large number of nodes, but it's probably going to cost you a lot in performance. It will give you good availability, so you'll be able to lose potentially a lot of nodes, um, but there won't be there won't be super good benefits. So there's work ongoing, and this is slightly longer term work. It's, it's probably not something that's going to come out this year to add sharding to CCF and to really scale out to larger volumes. At the moment. Um, if you run CCF applications, the best benchmarks we have for applications that are written in C++ are some, somewhere in the vicinity of like 50, 60,000 transactions per second. Um, so you can run like some stuff already. It's not, it's not extremely large scale, but you can run reasonably large applications across two data centers, geo-replicated and so on. Um, and with sharding, we, we're hoping to do more. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, okay, so the question is, if I'm a new user, uh, do I have to sign anything? And the answer is, uh, you don't have to. So it's, it's standard TLS. So if you have, as a, a, as a new user, uh, you won't automatically be allowed to take part in the service unless the service is configured to be very open. Typically, it's TLS end-to-end. -end, so what would happen is you'd have to talk to one of the members and say, I want to participate. Here's my identity. Can you add me? That member would stage a vote to add you. Then the rules, the rules of the governance would apply, and you know, you'd get it. Now, there could be schemes where you're automatically allowed to participate because your cert has been endorsed by some identity, of course, and then the governance might decide to do that. But you know, basically, that's, that's how the scheme works. And so once you've been added, you establish a TLS session, and you can start talking to the service. And that's good enough as far as the service is concerned. We do support client signatures uh, to support use cases where people might decide to proxy things. So if you are a client and you want to talk to CCF, uh, but you're not able to establish a direct TLS connection for whatever reason, you could, you could build a command, sign it with uh, your identity, send it to CCF, have someone else send it over to CCF. They need to be allowed to talk to CCF as well through their identity, but the command would be recorded with your signature and with your correct identity. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a trade off there. It's, it's a lot slower to do that if you're trying to send a lot of transactions. Um, but um, 
on the other hand, it means you can sort of route through uh, anywhere you want. Um, so that's, that's also nice. Um, and so if you're trying to build some workflows where you want verifiability for user um, transactions as well as governance transactions, maybe you, you would want to enforce that. So if you have some very sensitive user operations, maybe you force the users to sign, and then you store the signatures in the commands, and then people can offline verify things. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I'm running out of time or not. <laughs> no, no, but C Vesely is getting closer. Do, do we still have time? Or? Yes. Yep. One final question. <laughs> Yes. Um, so could you potentially even, because you have these trusted, you said you, you have the trusted uh, 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 mem members uh, like at the end, basically, the T-shared dimension. Yes. Uh, so could you basically also use this uh, to roll back the whole, uh, like a whole know, state so, in kind of like a like large-scale compromise? Could you state this somehow? Yes. So that's, that's a good question. And so the answer is yes. So if the members could decide that they all agree that the last 20 transactions did not happen. And so... This is a good thing sometimes if there's been a problem, but it could also be a bad thing because the members could be colluding. And what protection does the user have against that? And the answer is if they've kept their receipts for those transactions, they could say, I did have this receipt. It was committed at this version and it was signed by your service. And although you truncated it post recovery, I have proof that this was in there in the ledger. And so you still have some defense against that if the, if the members decide to truncate things because they want to remove an sort of inconvenient rather than illegitimate operation. Uh, but yes, the, when the members get together, so the process, the way it actually works is you spin up a bunch of nodes, they look at all the ledgers, they, they verify um, all the entries and the signatures that are in there, and they give the members back information about which, the, which, which one is the longest and has still been globally committed. Um, and then the members can decide to vote on that. They could decide to shorten the prefix for whatever reason. So signatures in the ledger, just to be clear, are signatures that are done by nodes. Um, so they allow you to attribute uh, the operations to a particular node. So if you know that some nodes were compromised, then this is how you can decide to, you know, truncate various things. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you.